Okay, that's down to uh, 9 sixteenths diameter, just like the other one. And I'm going to move over, allow one eighth of an inch for uh, the thickness of the head. And I'm going to go in with the cutoff tool for the packing gland. And I've set the caliper here for about 5 sixteenths, and I'm just going to go in with the tool until I am 5 sixteenths diameter. That's what it looks like and everything should be concentric. Now if this finish isn't good enough for you, it can again be held by uh, the step here and faced off, but that's good enough. I'll take that burr off and countersink th sink that ever so lightly and uh, this piece is done of course except for the holes that we have to drill. Small work requires small vices. Now I've already uh, established a center line. Remember I'm only going to put two screws into this uh, bottom head. Center line using this. And then I came in uh, on each side with my uh, depth gauge here. For whatever this is, it's a little bit less than an eighth of an inch. And, and I gave myself a little more room than I did, did on the other end. And I've got them center punched. and it's ready to go just like the other one. What I'm going to do here because you know you can see I'm on the wrong side actually but I'm going to go ahead and put the clearance holes in here from this side. Actually I'll use the tap drill size and, uh, and then put it onto the uh, cylinder itself. Two little notches there. Remember there was one notch on the other side like a wire herb. And I'm going to line up uh, this hole with the corner here. That gives it pretty much a 
45 degrees I guess you, you could say and uh, put it in the drill press off camera and these are already drilled the tap drill size and I'll drill down into the cylinder, cylinder now uh, 3 eighths deep or so and then tap them and then again I know I'm repeating myself on this but then the clearance uh, holes drilled in here and it's ready to screw on please be careful you don't break off one of these little 440 taps they're just like a matchstick and that's how quickly that they would uh, break and use some cutting fluid here and make sure you use the aluminum stuff not the steel stuff or you'll get a violent reaction and it'll turn black and gummy I think I've explained that before and be careful when you come to the bottom of a hole that you don't put too much pressure on it and break it off use a small tap wrench that is proportional to the size of the tap and this is what it looks like to this point one thing I want to make real clear here I'll take this uh, bottom head off real quickly that this center hole here that reamed eighth inch hole must be concentric with this uh, step here which will also make it concentric with the bore otherwise it will be binding as the piston moves up and down and the only way to relieve that will be to either enlarge this hole a little bit and it'll leak like crazy or machine the step down and, and allow it to float a little bit in the hole but you must have that concentricity or there'll be a bind and all of the steps that I've shown you here have a reason you know that so we have alignment and uh, and uh, no no tight spots no binding now you probably run into a little bit of that and you can tune it up you know at the uh, as you get near the end now I will turn my attention to the piston the piston rod and uh, the little part whatever we're going to call it here that goes on to the crank pin but we're getting so we're probably three-fourths through with the project the next part I'm going to make is this uh, small piece here I'm not even sure what to call that but I've changed the design on this prototype to where I start with square brass rather than uh, round brass on the single acting and the main reason I do that well I like the looks of the, of the square as well but it's easier to uh, drill that that cross hole in square stock and get it accurate I'm starting with quarter inch square brass key stock and I've actually already made this part but I drilled it well I held it in a four jaw chuck centered it and you could hold it in a square collet that would work even better then I center drilled it and uh, pilot drilled it and reamed it uh, one eighth inch you probably can get by with just drilling it then I uh, simply located this uh, cross hole and drilled it eighth inch on the drill press now remember when you drill brass a lot of times that drill bits gonna grab it and just jerk it out of your hands and and uh, bend the work or, or elongate the hole so be sure and hold that in a vise so it can't get away from you but also when it was in the uh, lathe yet I turned it down with a uh, sharp tool so I could get into the shoulder and I uh, just took this down to uh, about quarter inch it really doesn't matter at all now I'm ready to saw it off on that line and I'll just do that on the bandsaw with a hand hacksaw and either sand the end or it could be put back into the lathe and faced and chamfer this end it's a simple part to make but yet you can still fiddle around for 15 minutes with something like that my workbench is getting pretty messy I sawed it off in the vise with uh, l this little boy's hacksaw. I like that because it's got a real fine blade. and Got it mounted in the hand vise now, and or big pin vise, whatever you want to call this thing. Now I got some way to hold it. I won't burn my fingers because that brass turns hot instantly and conducts the heat into your fingers. So I'll take that to the little belt sander and, and square that up and uh, chamfer it just a little bit. And then that piece is done already. I just sanded this end on the uh, little abrasive sander and, and chamfered the corners a little bit or beveled them and laying it alongside of the ruler now you can see that the overall length is about 5 eighths of an inch 
and uh, the square part is 5 16 and the turn down part is about 5 16 the cross hole again is eighth inch and that can be about uh, oh approximately in the middle of that there which is a little less than 3 16 anyway find the center of that this is turned down to quarter inch or a little bit under and the end hole again was reamed one eighth inch so that piece is done and I'll turn my attention to the piston now this is 5 eighths uh, round steel and that's going to be the piston and the piston rod again is an eighth inch brass and it's about uh, two inches long but it, it's, that's not the final length but I've already faced the end of this and now I will center drill it and then uh, counter or uh, pilot drill it and I'm going to ream it eighth inch then I will turn this down to nine sixteenths or just a couple thousands over and I will do my final uh, turning and sizing after I have held it onto this with Loctite or the alternate of course is to thread that uh, 540 on uh, the end of the brass and tap it 540 but I'm going the Loctite route so off camera I will now turn that to 9 16 with uh, a double ended tool and I sure do like this double ended tool that I bought from Little Machine and I'll do that off camera I've turned it down to a little over 9 16 and the piston uh, does not quite fit into the cylinder yet. The hole is reamed. Now I'm going to cut it off uh, about quarter inch uh, long. Now if you want to put any little uh, grooves in there for oil rings or anything like that, that should be done now too, but I, I don't bother with that. And uh, it certainly isn't necessary to use an O-ring and I think if you do that you're going to find you got too much tightness so just a good fit is what we need for these little wobbler engines a good fit of the piston into the cylinder so I'll cut it off now I will now use Loctite to fasten the uh, little uh, piston rod into the piston remember this is still oversized and uh, I'm going to let that wait to set but do not fasten it uh, into this piece yet because first of all we do not know the final length of this rod yet and that will be determined upon assembly and the other thing is this piece here will have to be part of the assembly so that you can uh, uh, get this onto the rod and that's why I suggest if some of you feel like it you can thread one end you know and screw that on for quick assembly and disassembly but I'm going to uh, Loctite that on and be sure and remove any oil with the uh, thinner before you use Loctite. I will now lay out and then drill the steam ports in the cylinder. You can see there that uh, it's just a little bit over an eighth of an inch down so I've set my uh, handy little gauge here for just a hair over eighth inch and I've already got a center line on here one that I used when I laid out the uh, brass hole there but it may not be visible in the video but just mark it here and again over here and then I'm going to center punch it both sides there and those are going to be 3 30 seconds holes okay these holes are drilled 3 16 I, I need a deburred on the inside uh, but time for a short story back when I was in my prime and still teaching I carried in my pocket, I must have been a nerd, maybe still am, probably, I am. Uh, I had a pocket protector, it said brown and sharp on it, and I always carried these four tools with me here because I was doing a lot of layout uh, for all those years. And I didn't want the kids to use those because they would instantly uh, either ruin them or not return them. So this was a scriber that was really handy to have in my pocket. This is a little magnet that uh, it can clean chips and then my center punch and of course my brown and sharp six inch scale and uh, I think you've noticed in the video that there's a hunk missing out of this and I don't know why I don't throw it away but I'm kind of sentimental about this but uh, I asked a student to cut off 50 pieces of a certain size on that big Kalamazoo bandsaw and then we're standing by the bandsaw and he said Mr. Peterson do you mind if I use a ruler so I don't have to go back to the bench and get a ruler and I said, ah, 
all right, just this one time. And uh, he was doing the layout on, uh, on the bandsaw, and almost instantly he caught it in the running blade and nicked it. And then I learned my lesson. While the Loctite is setting on that other piece, I decided to pretty up the base just a little bit. So I'm going to put a cove molding, I think we might call that a cove molding, on all four sides. And that's a 3 8 ball end mill. You also could bevel this or chamfer it or do nothing. So I've already uh, determined the depth and uh, the feed in this way that I want by my sample piece here and it's about uh, uh, hundred thousandths each way and uh, as I rotate this I will each time use this as a stop loosen up the work bring it up against the stop so then it'll be consistent on all four sides and I won't change any of the settings on the XY or the depth and I will take two passes the first one across conventional milling then I'm going to increase the feed ever so lightly and uh, climb mill uh, going back because I always get a better finish on climb milling and I tried some different samples here uh, on the other end to see what I liked and I certainly didn't like it as deep as that first cut that I started to make with a half inch ball end mill so this is a 3 8 ball end mill there I go just a little fluid on there seems to help it's about 600 rpm that's my universal speed now you can see that the uh, surface finish is horrible but I don't care because I'm going to go back the other way climb milling and if you don't know what climb milling and conventional milling is be sure and go back and look at one of my other videos where I, I explain that now I'm going to raise the table 10,000 and that'll be my my finish pass and then I'll lower the table again when I do the next side of the work. I feed slow enough so I get a decent finish. Now I will rotate the work by 90 degrees and do this three more times. And that's what the finished base looks like, and I guess it almost looks like a plinth now, if you guys are familiar with the term plinth, with a lisp. I turned the piston down. I'm in the Atlas lathe now, and I got it in an eighth inch collet. Now, I didn't have it hanging out like that. It was close up against the collet, but uh, I take, took it down, and I miked it. So I was within about a half a thousandth of the bore, and the bore isn't exactly 9 sixteenths, but now I've got a pretty good fit. I need to take off just a little more, and I've been doing that uh, just with abrasive cloth in a manner like this until you get a good fit. Now it's got to turn freely. It's chamfered on both sides, and this is about 5 sixteenths long, this piston is. I'll be sure and wipe that good, get the abrasive dust off that before you put it into the cylinder. And I already got some oil in the cylinder, and you can run it in a little bit too, like this, until you get just the fit that you want. And I'm just about there. I think I am there. I can always go back and change that, take a little bit off, or put this back in the other lathe with that flappy deal that I had. I took the flywheel off the engine so I could move the crank in and out, and I need to determine now the uh, the length, well I know what the length of the stroke is, but the position of the stroke so that I can uh, cut the connecting rod off. So right now 
I'm at the bottom of the stroke and as I turn it you see I'm a little bit too high right now and it doesn't go quite far enough down and I want to uh, determine that so that I have an equal space on each end because you know where the little uh, steam ports are already so by trial and error here I'll, I'll trim a little bit off and I'm going to start with taking off about 3 30 seconds of an inch and then I'll reassemble it like this and when I finally determine that I got the exact right length connecting rod then I will uh, Loctite this into place, but of course I'll put that lower head on there before I do that also